Isn't that amazing? That's the drunk Smurf <laughs> Rob <laughs> Vanstone. Now it's on repeat. <laughs> this is a. I'm Rob Vanstone. This is Dan Plaster. Welcome to the, as advertised, the 56th edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. The best app ever for an immature person like me is called Voice Changer. I went on there the other day, and and uh, you can do all sorts of great things. <laughs> All sorts of amazing things with this thing. Welcome to the 56th edition. I think I sound better with this thing. That's anyway. your, that, that would be the shadowy, <laughs> the drug dealing, the anonymous. <laughs> Are you uh, mewling cocaine? Yes. Uh, I, nobody really knew about my cartel until today, but I, <laughs> I have one. Uh, Dan Plaster, uh, one of the absolute greatest people ever born, uh, currently a video, video producer with CBC, mm -hmm. formerly of Global, which would make him a Global player. Global, play <laughs> Global player. Global yes. player once upon a time. Formerly of the Rough Riders, formerly of the Regina Pats, formerly of the Riffle Royals football team. Yes. 89 uh, provincial champions. And now a power lifter. He's going to lift this desk at the end of this podcast. An old, tired, broken power lifter. <laughs> so I think I'm an old, tired, broken everything right now. Well, you're you're fitting right in with the other member of this uh, podcast as we far as great, it being though. old, tired. Yes. We, don't we look nice? It's better than, we should do this around the lake. Some I mean, people would suggest I should do it across in, the lake. Into the lake. <laughs> into the lake. <laughs> Jump in a lake. <laughs> no, it's, actually, it was funny. I ran, I ran into Dan one day. I was walking around the lake, and he was doing something more productive. And we ran into each other, and I said, would you like to be on the podcast? And he said, no. So I, pay, I paid him, and now he's here. <laughs> Absolutely how it went? not. No, I love to. I mean, I've, I watch this on the, the Leader Post website all the time, and uh, and great technical work. It sounds great. It looks great. Murray's, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, we, like, we, what, we barred Murray from this one to enhance the Where's Roger? Show. Roger was here last week. I should have brought Roger. I, I had the 44, from her 44, Roger Aldag cut out last week, but I thought I was, uh, that, that wouldn't. That was my gag for last week. This week's gag is, is, the, <laughs> is voice changer. Well, no, whenever so. I see it, you just think of the that that era offensive line and the Brian Illibrins come to your come to mind and the Mike Andersons and the Bob Polies and I think we just almost Vic named Stevenson. the Vic Stephen. There's the line. Yes. So it's, it's, Ken Moore, one of the most underrated players in Rider history, was a starting left tackle for the Riders when they won the Great Cup in '89. And mm -hmm. there's such a premium is is placed upon the left tackle, and there's such a I think a handsome compensation going to the left tackle these days. But people have kind of forget that Ken Moore was the left tackle for that '89 team, and uh, did a tremendous job protecting Ken Austin's backside when he threw for 474 yards in the Great Cup um, during that triumphant fall when you were also starring for the Riffle Royals. At center. At center. At center. Marker nest type center. What number did you wear? 60. Oh, wow. Yeah. Gino, Gene Makowski? Yes. Dan well, Plaster. Dan, oh, gosh. <laughs> Difference of about eight <laughs> inches and many... Pa well, not as... Pa Gino's pretty skinny now. He, he looks is. good. He looks great. It took Gino to win a title a lot, lot longer to win a title than you did, though. Yeah. You were just cleaning up in high won, school. I wonder if he won one in Saskatoon when he was playing high school he, high school football. There is one for the the, the books. But. If not, that's a failure of everyone around him. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about left tackles. Look at how important Chris Van Zeele has been for Hamilton and how awful Toronto was last week. Yeah, not the greatest move by the Toronto Argonauts. I who mean, happen to be coming here for a Monday game. Oh, like in the chops. The Riders have to be that's i mean i mean we're jumping right in i guess that's the way you want to do things and that's or i can be... play my phone a little more no let's not play the phone we do not need drug cartel <laughs> rob vanstone anymore <laughs> but yeah i mean it, you will talk about toronto i mean that was haunting and for a home opener that's the last thing the argos uh, needed and a great crowd they were giving away free this free that free touchdowns to the hamilton tiger cats oh. it was a real Right to Lovely the bitter day. end, that pick six at oh. the end. You're going, I oh, what would have been worse, sitting on that one or just walking it into the end zone? Oh, goodness, <laughs> that was That's what everybody in the country just went. Oh no! And Corey Chamberlain's a defensive coach. Mm -hmm. That's the that you'd think. Okay, the defense is going to be sound with Corey Chamberlain there, but uh, I think his last seven games as a head coach, six or seven, his defense has given up thirty plus points and. They did that in the second half on Saturday. <laughs> Man, that so, was a woodshed beating. Oh, I have, my goodness. I haven't seen that, especially especially in the first few weeks of a season in the CFL because it's it's like the last two weeks of preseason. It's such a mess. You don't know what's going to happen. There will be a lot of dumb penalties and a lot of missed tackles, but not nothing like that. You wonder, though, if both teams are salivating, both offenses are salivating at the thought of facing the other team's defense. If the Riders and Argos is allowed to combine 108 points mm -hmm. in week two, I Riders mean, held Ottawa to 44, which is uh, which is about a half for the Hamilton Tiger Cats against Toronto. It was, 
I don't know which was worse or which was more shocking that the, a very good, very talented, very quick rider offense let up that much, especially through the air. That for, Didn't for, see that coming at all. For a vaunted secondary that has been ball hawking for the last two or three years, they don't even have a turnover this year. The rider defensive has not forced a turnover, which is the main reason why they're 0-2 to begin the year, because if they were even even in the turnover battle, they'd be 2-0. and I mean, that's as simple as it go, as it comes, because their offense against Hamilton, their offense was better than Hamilton's offense. They had more yards per play. They had more plays from scrimmage. Same thing against Time Ottawa. The possession was 36 minutes plus against Hamilton. That's they just I mean. didn't score very much. That was old school, solid football by the Riders in Hamilton. And then it just kind of flipped the script. If you combined, it's like you and I, one bad leg and the other bad back. And if you combine, <laughs> if you combine I've got pieces, both actually, you're healthy. If you could combine our pieces together, we'd have a very average athlete. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the you're the lone champion in the discussion. And well, that's the lone champion. Well, not the really. bulwark of the, the offensive line the bul- for the '89 Riffle Riffle Royals. Yes, no, there is many more talented people than I was. Thank Who was goodness. on that team, by the way? Do you remember Brian Harrison? Yes, yes, he used to play on our touch football team, the Jackals. Oh, really? Because uh, one of our players, he was the. Uh, Brother-in-law of one of our players, okay, Mark Johnson. Oh, because I played against Brian uh, for a couple of years in that Alberta Football League when I was living in Red Deer. I played for the Red Deer Buccaneers, and he was quarterbacking the Calgary Gators and then the Calgary Wolfpack the next year. Tremendous athlete. Oh, unbelievable. Daryl Leeson's still playing in that league. <laughs> wow. He's, he's still <laughs> playing for the Calgary Wolfpack. Hey, what, so 45, 46? What would he be? Yeah, he'd be the same age as myself. I would say he was, yeah, he's a Hudson Bay kid, so I think he was around that, that vintage. Man. Just history, but yeah, but it with the rider offense, it was let, let's stick to the positives because we always just are positive. Let's try to be positive. That was fun. That was that was great fun. It was a tonic. It it washed a lot of. I mean, you and I have talked about it, a lot of the ineptitudes of the rider offense, and it's funny how one game just kind of washes that taste out of everybody's mouth. And man, if they could put that kind of effort, even a three quarters of that effort, not just. July 1st against the the Argos or the next Saturday after that. But if they could piece even 60% of that offense with 80% of what the rider defense usually is, that the West could be theirs. And, and, and that's the positive side of things. The negative side is, is this a one-hit wonder for Cody Fajardo and that offense? And are we going to go back to square one? I guess that's the question. You don't question. know. And I mean, other, other teams are now going to have film on Cody Fajardo. So how is... <laughs> How, how, are, how are they going to adapt to him? How is he going to adapt? But just to see someone come out and not only have a, a terrific game, but throw the ball downfield, do things that uh, showed some aggression and some ambition. Um, people were so, I think, inured to what had been type, typecast as a Stephen McAdoo offense. Run, run on first down, hit screen on second down, and hope that John Ryan can boom one on third down. <laughs> And outkick the coverage, according to some. Although I would maintain the coverage teams need to bear some responsibility there too. The coverage um, teams need to cover. So now, now you're looking at this, and I think it, it's interesting because after the first game, the offense was at least in terms of point production below average. The defense was terrific, and there was a lot of grumbling about that game. You listen to the the call-in shows after the game in Ottawa, and the Riders gave up 44 points, but. I think the, ten, the tenor of a lot of the post-game commentary was a lot more optimistic and a lot more hopeful. It almost felt like a victory, even though they'd lost, because there's this hope provided by a young quarterback and an offense that's exciting people. Isn't it funny Isn't when, they're, oh, when they're entertained? Yeah. When people are entertained, people are positive. And when people are not entertaining, because that game in Hamilton was not entertaining. That felt like preseason game number three. It was a bit oh, of a dirge. Yeah. And... That was the complete opposite against Ottawa in their in their home opener as the Riders come to town against a full house, great atmosphere out at uh, out in Ottawa, and it was it felt like let's go back to like 1992. It felt like mm-hmm. like shoot the lights out, entertaining football, but both of the both of those games had their warts. Both losses have their warts. Same amount of warts, just different. Yeah, it's, it's amazing though when the when the offense is substandard i think there's a lot more of a uh, visceral reaction than there is when the defense is substandard because people want that offense and to, to to do something and they've been waiting for that for a while it, it almost felt like that game was the first rocky movie which was tremendous <laughs> but then the hero loses at the end but people still say good movie yeah 
right? I wonder if there's a parallel there. I, Please I think, save this podcast, Dan. That was a terrible analogy. No, no, no. I, I love the original Rocky movie, and it makes sense because you know what happens in Rocky 2? He chases the chicken. Or was that, was that Rocky 3 where he chases? Or is it Rocky 9? Rocky 9, where he is, uh, there's too many of them. And Rocky Henry. Rocky. <laughs> oh. Rocky Butler. Rocky Butler. There's been a few Rockies. Rocky Butler. And there was Rock, Rock, Perton, Rock Perdoni, too. Yes. So. Rock Preston. Rock Preston. We're so awful. I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry people. Where have we gone with this? Um, but For Dan think, Plaster, I'm Rob Van Stone. <laughs> yes, so, but, it, but I think with the offense, it harkens back to those times. This, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders traditionally have always won with outstanding offenses. When they, any era when they have been great, they have had an outstanding offense. And that's what people always kind of wish back to when it's, Fun and it's Ken Austin throwing for almost six thousand yards in a season and six hundred yards in a game, or or even Darian Durant throwing for three and running for fifty, or Ron Lancaster throwing for one hundred and fifty and George Reed running for two hundred. It's it. I think that's what people here have been trained to understand what is positive, and positive is awesome offense. And good defense. And that's the nature of the CFL, too. You need to have a, an offense. And the writers showed last season that as good as the off defense is or was, if the offense can't at least be respectable, you're not gonna you're only gonna get to a certain point. If you look at the Grey Cup victories in Rider history, and three of the four victories, the Riders quarterback has thrown for three touchdown passes. And in the one that the one that was the exception there, the two thousand and seven Grey Cup, Kerry Joseph didn't have a great game throwing the ball, mm -hmm. but he ran for one hundred and one yards. And guess what? He was the most outstanding player in the league that year. Mm -hmm. So I think you need that offense to to carry the team. And if the defense can come along for the ride, in some cases, as was the case, I guess most notably in nineteen eighty nine, fair enough. And the Riders' defense didn't play well against Hamilton in the Grey Cup in eighty nine, but they sure did. The week a week earlier against the Edmonton Eskimos, when Tracy Ham, who had no had no idea what was coming at him or from which direction, so the defense can be a complementary player. But this is still the CFL. I think you still need that offense as a strong foundation. I think that's why people are heartened by this by the performance of the Riders in Ottawa because okay, there's some hope. And coming into the season, there was so much talk about the quarterbacking and whether or not Zach Kalaros was playing. I still think there were going to be concerns with the court about the quarterbacking. And now you have this 27 year old. Cody Fajardo doing what he did, and it just, I don't think anybody really saw that coming. Did you? No, well, gosh, no. Because he's always been that third down guy. Yeah. Anywhere he's been, Toronto, BC, he's always been that third down guy. And I think because he's never had a lot of the spotlight elsewhere in the CFL, this being his first CFL start and playing so well, and if he continues to play well, it kind of feels like if you're a Ryder fan, he's ours. And we did this or they did this. This is his team and his offense and that sort of thing. If things continue to progress or even just stay as it was, because if you can complete 80% of your passes and throw for 354 yards and a touchdown, you just want to keep that going or two touchdowns, sorry. And you just want to keep that going. And I think that's a little bit of it. It's not bringing in that. It's not bringing in Trevor Harris or bringing in Mike Riley. This is bringing in a second string guy that somehow the, 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 we have built into something. And I think it's something that fans can really glom onto. I remember in, in 2008 when Darian Durant went on that little run before he injured his ribs against Toronto. And he went into Toronto and, and had the victory, uh, quarterback the Riders. Or, pardon me, went into Hamilton and quarterback the Riders to a comeback win. It's like, where did this come from? They're starting the third string quarterback in week three. And look what he does. Mm -hmm. And then he follows up with a tremendous game against Montreal. And people are just, wow. He beat Anthony Calvillo at Mosaic Stadium. And it's like, wow. And that's the kind of, and look what Darian Durant became. Now we're going to see we'll have to see a lot more from Cody Fajardo until we can establish those parallels with more credibility or more certainty. But just to have that, even a glimmer of hope from the quarterbacking position and, and by extension from the offense, that's just... It's enlivening. It's it's amazing how it changed the conversation around here. And yeah, a, a completely a complete 180 because it was pretty much the same conversation after that Hamilton loss as it's been after pretty much when the Riders lost in that in the East Final to Toronto till last week. Yeah. That, with very few exceptions. Very few exceptions. Yeah, maybe the what was it, the three hundred and sixty yard games that Caleros had, but all of it was in the first half. He had that big game 10. in Montreal he threw for three hundred and ninety four. Yeah. And then they went to Calgary and won. Yeah. Zach Calaros was greatest moment as a rider. They didn't even throw a touchdown pass that day, but Zach Calaros was tremendous in Calgary. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, there were those two games. Mm-hmm. Others were it was serviceable. And others, actually, without Zach Kolaros, was when the offense completely cratered. Mm-hmm. Um, they lost at home to Montreal. And then, of course, they lost that West fi- West semifinal to Winnipeg. And uh, mm. Yeah, that and, and I think that has been kind of the tone. And just if you can, it just feels like a little bit of the shackles are starting to I, come off. And I think it's it, it's it's even good for Stephen McAdoo to just kind of yeah. have that. Because you look back at the offense, not last year, but the year before with Kevin Glenn, it was awesome. Until Kevin Glenn would throw the pick six, or he would have that big mistake. But they would go downfield. They had the three one thousand yard receivers, and I don't know if there's that pace right now. If Kyron Moore, or Shaq Evans, could pick up that thousand yard pace, but I mean, that's kind of has that more of that offense than it was of last year's offense. I don't know what changed. Maybe it was just the direction that they wanted that offense to be more ball control, more of a. Even know it's not modern offense because most modern offenses, if you look from the Big Twelve on, everybody just wants to throw the ball all over the place. It seems like it's everything's flip flop from the NFL to the CFL, but uh, it's it's good to see people love offense. I think that's what we're in summary. People love offense. Well, they're in the fundamentally they're in the entertainment business, Mm -hmm. and uh, as much as coaches may say that their job is to win, if they're winning and nobody's showing up to watch. That's a problem. And so you've got to, I think, entice the people with, I think, continued demonstrations of what people saw against uh, Ottawa. Now, is he going to come out and throw, go 27 for 34 for 360 every week? No. But if he can just show some consist- consistency mm-hmm. and, and show that it wasn't an aberration, I think people will buy in pretty quickly. And the other thing, too, is he's such a, he seems to be such a tremendously nice guy. I think if there's anything to Cody Fajardo at all, if, 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 if if he should, continues to show some pro, some promise, people are going to love this guy because mm-hmm. he's such a nice person. People love offense, and look at all the jerseys that are in the crowd. It's usually of the offensive stars. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the the jersey you see the most is still Naaman Roosevelt's, and because he's plaster like, sixty. No, that would be a white jersey with <laughs> with royal blue and red trim, um, size four X. <laughs> I think I can I borrow it. <laughs> yeah. um, it but, but even if you look back to past jerseys, like I, I, I sometimes I still go back to you think as the marketing side of things, as a fan or as what you could market it. Jerseys, uh, jersey shirts. It's just I think offensive stars are what people really like to hang on to. And I think that's kind of a little bit of what's been missing even the last few years with the riders. They have been a very good football team and Ed Gainey's a superstar. But how many people will buy an 11 jersey? I mean, I had a 42 Eddie Lowe jersey, but that Eddie Lowe's my favorite player of all time, but I'm odd. And I <laughs> freely admit that. <laughs> he was tremendous. Yeah. And I mean, like the whole University of Alabama thing, but that's just kind of that... I loved it. But I mean, the the same fan <laughs> would actually, <laughs> will, will, will in the past buy your 7 Dressler or your... Your eighty-one Elgard, or your like your your five Austin. Your would you buy sixteen Burgess? I don't know if you. Oh, done. absolutely. Uh, but but that's what people would buy because they're the stars. Offense, offensive players are the stars. I hate to say it, but it is. And and even from a marketing department, if yeah, if you're Cody Fajardo and you keep playing like this, and you stay here, you have work for life. Yeah, you you've got it made, and if. And will people be taking Jefferson off the back of their seven jerseys and putting putting Fajardo on there? I don't think anybody's still got a seven jersey with Adams on the back. But oh boy, <laughs> that would be oh, that'd be an odd white shirt, huh? Seven four. Oh, you could just put seven four. No, I'm just kidding. Four seven's been a popular number around here for other reasons. So yeah. I guess that's an easier transition for a lot of people who are still wearing the the seven with a different surname on the back. So mm-hmm. I always had seventeen for Joey Walters, and uh, in fact, my wife still wears a Joey Walters jersey to autograph Joey Walters jersey to ride her home games. So what are the rules around CFL numbers? Can you still have a 17 as a receiver? Cause I know it's pretty stagnant. Yeah, you can do it. Oh, okay. It's but, just kind of all over the place. But, 26 uh, for Doug Flutie. I guess you can still do that. Is they've got to have, um, it, it makes, it breaks my heart every time I see 17 and then it's not Walters on top. So it's usually 17 and some random Canadian special teamer or Reggie Slack or Reggie or, Slack. Yeah. It's not really a quarterback number either. That's too high. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange oh, sorry, 18, number. Peyton you don't Manning. see a lot of 17s, but uh, yeah, 
18 you have that's a big nfl quarterback number you know, you know peyton manning and that sort of thing i got an 18 bronco shirt at home so and, and so you should and it that's doesn't a, fit as well as it did during there's a super bowl attached range. to that one now so that's good so what about the defense we've talked so much about the offense and the defense i don't know what to make of it yet dan week one tremendous um there were comp- there were criticisms of the hamilton offense but jeremiah mazzoli and friends Minus Luke Tasker showed what that offense can do in week two. So the Riders mm-hmm. held down what was in week two a very good Hamilton offense. And then in week two against Ottawa, that defense was only a rumor. Mm-hmm. What What is this defense? Is it week one or is it week two or is it somewhere in the middle? I mean, I, like anything in the CFL, everybody always says, wait, the season doesn't start until after Labor Day. I I don't agree with that. I think you don't know. I Tell that to Corey Chamberlain and yeah, Brendan Tam. <laughs> but that's what I mean. After, I think after six games, you'll know what it is. I think it might be somewhere in between, between that very stiff. The, the, that defense in Hamilton wasn't like the last two years where it was big play after big play. It was a sack or a pick or a fumble for a touchdown or or that sort of thing. It was a very, almost had a very Richie Hall feel it a very did, didn't it? Yeah. very bend but don't break force a lot of two and outs a lot of five and outs that sort of thing and then i don't know uh, where dominic davis just decided to throw the ball all over the place but nick marshall had himself a tough night and nick marshall is incredibly talented and he is a solid corner and has always given up the big play he'll give up one or two every game but he usually make one the other oh that's to, what i mean to, like to that's why he's, that's why he's awesome like yeah. that's that that harry skipper used to do that that is a great – because he would gamble. Harry Skipper would try to jump – in the 89 Great Cup, he did that. He tried to jump in front. He thought he had an interception in 20. Yeah, see, yeah. 20. see you later. Yeah. So that is a that is an incredible analogy. That is – he is a modern-day Harry Skipper. You know, Harry Skipper would would make that big play mm-hmm. and uh, not in the 89 Great Cup. But for the, for the most of his career, Harry Skipper was that type of guy. And Nick Marshall on, on Thursday, there were so many plays. You would think one or two of those would have at least been knocked down. Well, what but whether was. with the hat, the the catches that were being made mostly by Dominic Grimes, uh, the throws that were being made by Davis, maybe it was just one of those nights where you just couldn't buy a break. Even even the one play that wasn't caught and should have been. What been do you think reviewed. of that? The no challenge. Do you blow your challenge early in the game? It's interesting. It's, that's it's a bit of do you do you play that card that early and then not have it in your pocket? They probably would have won that challenge and would have kept it. But mm-hmm. do you still play that card at that juncture? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's. If you have two challenges like the old days, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, it'd be, it. yeah, you just waste one. But I yeah, and I understand that. I don't care either way. It just happened. I'm not a big fan of the challenges. It just happened on the field, and you just roll with it. And and that rider defense, Nick Marshall to play off that is was the king of the big play. Ed Gainey, king of the big play. Willie Jefferson was a big play guy. He would disappear. That was one thing about Willie Jeff. He would disappear once in a while, but, man, he would come up with a big play. And who is that player that will come up with the big play? Who is going to be that guy on Monday? Well, I mean, Willie Jefferson was so dynamic, and mm-hmm. they could do so many things with him. And I think his absence really limits what Jason Shivers can do as the coordinator. I mean, Willie Jefferson could intercept screen passes. He could drop back and cut off a hot route. He could rush the passer. He could do pretty much anything you wanted a player to, to do. Toby Antigua could play safety and then he could play defensive end. So you can move all these pieces around. Mm-hmm. And what you don't see now from this defense, and again, I'm relying upon fragmentary evidence considering there's only been two games played, but yeah. that's a pretty standard defense that the Riders seem to be playing. They have the front four. They j- More than 80%, of, roughly 80% of the time, they rush with the four. Last year, they would be teasing the offense and they'd be showing blitz and then dropping people back into coverage. You never knew where Willie Jefferson was going to be. Sometimes you didn't even know where Charleston Hughes was going to be because he dropped back into coverage. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to be that maze that they're uh, challenging offenses to try and negotiate anymore. Yeah, Chris Jones had layers. That that defense so had I. layers. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> yes, I have squishy and hard. No, I'm so sorry. It's all right. But it, it did. And it, that's why it goes back to it's, it is a very solid base defense. I mean, Micah Johnson roams a little bit around the defensive line. I like the fact that they'll go with two Canadians along as defensive tackles and then with Hughes and Johnson, and they'll kind of float in and out along the defensive line. It would be nice to see a few more blitz, blitz packages and – 
and that sort of thing to see where guys come from. I don't know if it's just the youth of the, the linebacking core or some of the essential keys that, that, that you do send on those, those type of blitzes, but I, I, it, maybe it's just a, a sense of it's just the second game. That could be it. And then it's going to be a feast with, with the, the very, very mediocre Toronto Argonaut quarterbacking, whether it's Franklin or Bethel Thompson. Or yeah. Bethel McLeod, Bethel Thompson, yes. The man it with three last probably names. Probably doesn't matter a, a whole lot. No. I, oh, that was haunting. I still can't believe it. I I watched most of that game, and I felt so bad for Ricky Ray. They bring him up to the booth, and it's just they're just getting mucked. <laughs> I felt bad for the Argos. You, you, that that really mm. makes you worry about football in Toronto when 16,000 actually isn't a bad crowd for the Argos. So you get that, and you've got the Darrell Walker bobbleheads, and you've got all the little gimmicks and the reduce this and the reduce that. And the one thing they couldn't reduce was Hamilton's point production. Oh, he reduced beer in Winnipeg this week. They did. Yes. Oh, can you imagine cheap beer at Mosaic Stadium for the opener? Come on, guys. In the press box. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a beer since um, 1995. That's La- awesome. Labor Day weekend. Actually, I haven't drank since Labor Day weekend 95, except for one aberration after the 2010 Grey Cup at, uh, at the West yeah, Edmonton Mall. Everybody needed that one. I was <laughs> like, oh, I need a drink. So, uh, yeah, this will be my 25th uh, Labor, 25th straight Labor Day weekend uh, without... Uh, Are you Diet Pepsi or Diet Coke guy? I am... Uh, Diet Pepsi tastes more like Pepsi than mm-hmm. Diet Coke tastes like Coke. I 100% but Coke agree. is better than... Coke, big, the general Coke is better than the general Pepsi. I'm with you 100%. 100%. And that's why I love fountain drinks. Yes. Big. They wrecked every diet I've ever tried to go on. I, I love the fizz. How about in movie theaters now where it has just a thousand oh. different flavors? Mr. Pibb is in there. You can actually. Really? Get, yeah. You can get fake Dr. Pepper, the American you know Mr. Pibb. I went to Kramer versus Kramer last night at the uh, at the Galaxy Theater. I'd never seen it before. It's a 40-year-old movie. Yeah. I'd never seen it. And uh, my wife went with me. Uh, she's still with me. People are I'm somewhat encouraged by that she just and, and i looked at this buffet of drinks and just like i can choose anything i want here mm-hmm. and i ended up going with a minute made light lemonade isn't it wonderful it's so great and because like, they don't have the really large cups anymore well, it's probably for the best i want a, like a really large cup it would be the withdrawal of the deposit bucket <laughs> <laughs> but i took my mom to john wick three she loves the wick she's a strange really? woman yeah and she was just awesome she's like this is awesome so she a whole bunch of different flavors of iced tea so she was the same way she's like more fountain drink Yes, you can. And various, um, there's various fast food stores now where you have a, a choice of all these options. Mm-hmm. I, it's great. How do we get onto that? It's a, it's a uh, look at us. That's why we got. <laughs> 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 but sometimes having an option is not good. But it's it, yes, it was. I'm glad they don't let me pump the bowl of my own butter on my own popcorn because it would just be butter soup. Yeah, I I had butter on the popcorn last night. And my wife said butter. Yeah. All of it. She she kind of reprimanded me for that. Mayonnaise if I have no, I'm just kidding. Ugh. No, no. Save this podcast. How save. do we save this podcast now? Actually we have we have viewer que- viewer. viewer. We have a question from a viewer or reader or whatever we oh, call it. Oh wonderful. Them. Um and I, I would be They're remiss much smarter than us. We get the annual question, so I'd be remiss if I didn't actually acknowledge it. Brad Thompson. Hmm. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Brad. Uh, thank you for responding so quickly. I'm still not sold on that Alamimian will play it all for the riders. Okay, that's the first part. Good question. Good question. Only Solomon and the training staff knows. He has done an autograph signing. So that's there's he signed a contract and he signed, signed autographs, but he hasn't played for the team. You wonder if, when they resume practicing this week, um, if Solomon, Al- Solomon Alamimian will be out there. And if so, what that means to the linebacking core, because Cameron Judge is playing pretty well. Very well. Very well. And that's what I go back. I love... And I've said this before, I love what kind of gets me back loving this team is that core of Canadians that they've picked up the last few years. Judge, Shepley, Tights, McKinnis, Lenius. Love those guys. If they stay, you can build one heck of a football team for the next five to ten years. I don't know. I, that's just what I, I – it just – when you have great Canadians, you have a lot of hope, and that's something you can really build on. I love those Goes back to – look at the Canadians in the 89 Rough Riders. Sure. And the 89 Riffle Royals. It's, it's all Canadians. Uh, my first question is how long of a leash has Fajardo earned – this is from Brad Thompson again. Is how long of a leash has Fajardo earned himself after that game? I figure maybe two bad starts and we see him pulled. I think he's got a considerably longer leash than he would have had had he struggled early in, in, in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 
they like Isaac Harker, I think justifiably so, but I don't think you make an impulsive or quick move with Cody Fajardo. The way, given what he's shown you now, I think, I think it's time for some for some patience. You're going to expect some blips because that was almost too good to be true. That was a blip the other way. Let him play through the. Let your starting pitcher get through the rough inning. I I wouldn't have a quick leash with Cody Fajardo at all. I think you'd lose him. Well, not lose him, but it would really affect him if he ha- say somehow has a bad first half, throws two interceptions, and somehow Toronto's up ten three. You ride him the rest of the way. Shooter's got to shoot. Yeah. And uh, he looks like the guy that just needs to throw the ball around the park to feel comfortable. And I, I agree with you. Let him go. One game, two games. I mean, if it's two horrific games, sure. Yeah. But he's shown he can do it after one game. And even if it's just a mediocre game, you let him ride. Because he's starting to earn. He's earned that. After that one game, he has earned the leash to be that much longer. I agree. Uh, the other question is as follows. I like many, like many, I like what I saw from Harker. This is still from Brad Thompson. Um, I like that he is 23 and I see grooming possibilities. What is the process now for keeping him and involving him slowly in the offense? It, it's, it's interesting because they're trying to develop a couple of young quarterbacks right now. Mm-hmm. And can you develop what do you develop one at the expense of the other? How do you? Do you get into that situation? That weird BC Lions situation where they had Lule, Riley, and did they have Nichols? Did they have all three at the same time? I don't believe so. Wasn't no. So the, Nichols, there was Nichols was in Edmonton. Nichols is in Edmonton. Oh, so it would have been Edmonton where they had the a lot of it ends up like what Nichols did. He would just end up leaving for a different team. Like whoever is the odd man out, it would be the guy leaving for the other team. The Riders played that had this sort of a situation like this. I don't want to anoint anybody, but in 80, 87, part of eighty seven. Uh, Austin and Burgess were both here at the same time, 88 and 89, obviously. And uh, there, that was quarterbacking then at a much higher tier than the Rough Riders have proven they can mm-hmm. for a long a, time. approach. But if one's struggling, you go to the other guy. And uh, it, at some point, ideally, they become interchangeable and you don't lose either one of them by putting the other guy in because you know you've got the reliable option should one falter. So... I think you need to see a lot more of Cody Fajardo and a lot more of Isaac Harker before you can have the comfort that they can be 1A and 1B. But yeah, and with, but over a long season, too, I think both are going to get their chance. Oh, for sure. Both will get their chance. This is the CFL, and not everybody's bully by Mitchell. Not everybody plays all 18 games all the time. Even Ricky Ray lost a lot of time to his... Anthony Calvillo was very, very durable, but, man, that two-quarterback system sometimes... What was it with the Broncos? Sean Moore and... When they try to go in and out, was Sean Moore was it Tommy Maddox? Yeah, mm. it was. It was. It was. Um, it was. Oh, it was. It was against. It was a ninety-two, and it was awful. Yeah, I don't remember Sean Moore because he's a University of Virginia quarterback. I just remember him playing in a bowl game against Major Harris. Was or, it Tommy? Sorry, was it? Was it Tommy? Sean, sorry, they played. It was West Virginia, Virginia. Just, oh, I'm trying to remember that stupid Bronco quarterback rotation. Either way, it's positive. Back to the question. It is a I'm positive Googling situation. That was bothering me. As you can, oh, what have I done? <laughs> um, it, it 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 is positive, and what happens is it's it's it might happen in Winnipeg here soon with Chris Strebler, because he has shown even right out of the gate that he can play very very well. And what happens when he's a free agent coming up? I think this year, if Matt Nichols plays all right, gets hurt, and Strebler plays really well, that's the situation that Winnipeg will be in at the end of this offseason is you have a very young quarterback in Chris Strebler and a more of a veteran guy like Matt Nichols who bounced around before getting the start in Winnipeg. And then something's got to give with one of those two mm-hmm. parts. The other team, it was, mm-hmm. it, by the way, it was Tommy Maddox. There you go. Who was the, the other option on that dismal December day <laughs> when the Broncos <laughs> rotated court. Tom Landry did that with, with Roger Staubach and Craig, Craig Morton, Morton in the yeah. 71 season. And they'd actually almost be playing tag coming in. Your turn, your turn, your turn. And eventually... Uh, I think both quarterbacks said to Tom Landry, I don't care which one you choose, just choose one. Yeah. And Roger Staubach ended up leading the, the Cowboys to a Super Bowl victory in 72 over Miami, 24-3. to And they faced each other in the... Did Craig Morton... No, it was Pittsburgh. Craig Morton played for Denver in the 78 70, Super Bowl. Yes, and yeah. he, half of he, he, eight of his passes were caught. <laughs> half of them were caught by <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> that was an awful day. So, yeah. So they ended up playing each other in the Super Bowl later. So that's, I mean... Yeah, sort of... <laughs> But as, as oh, we drifted, I'm glad we haven't brought up wrestling. Let's go that, back to popcorn. Yes, popcorn. And but it's it, it the positive side of things. It's this is a good thing. This is this is a great situation if both play well. 
This is the situation that the Riders have been looking for for a long time, going through the Brett Smiths, the Tino Sinceris, the Seth Dakies, the <laughs> you you name whatever quarterback of flavor that was brought in through training camp and spring camps. There's been probably three dozen of them that have come through since Darian Durant has left left this team, and to now have hopefully two, that's great. It's very sad what what has happened to Zach Kalaros. That shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, this oh. all has happened because of that illegal hit that for which oh, Simone still... Lawrence has yet to be punished. How is that? I don't get it. Like, come on. Never mind. I it's don't a mess wanna... from both. It's terrible. From the league's perspective and from the Players Association's perspective, it has not been handled well in either account. Not at all. He, like, I know he's, what was the, what the broadcast say? Uh, that he, obviously he does feel bad and everybody does feel bad when you hurt somebody, but this is not uncommon for Simone Lawrence. This is common for Simone Lawrence. He is what he is. Him and Kyrie Zaber are the last two of those type of players. Although he'd never been suspended before for anything. He'd never been fined before for anything. People have leveled that accusation at Simone Lawrence, but if you look at the discipline meted out by the league, he's a first-time mm-hmm. offender. Walks the line. And ask any defensive coordinator, that's what you want. You have a guy that walks the line and you take the good with the bad. And if you get dinged for one, you're willing to eat it. But if he's a constant offender, you're not. If he's Vontez Burr effect, you're not going to eat that. But if. But this is everything they want to eradicate from the yes. game. Not Simone Lawrence, but that hit. That hit. That's a classic case of what you want to extract from the game. So the league comes out, issues a two game penalty that I think was, was fair. Um,. And then the Players Association, you, you cannot get anyone in the Players Association seems to renounce that type of hit and say, we don't want that in the game. I understand it's under appeal, but this is the Players Association that have been saying player safety has to be a priority, leading into the collective bargaining negotiations. So now three offensive plays into the season, you get that hit that you want to completely extract from the game, and nobody will denounce it from the player's side. That's yeah, exasperating. And, and how... how... Another thing I don't understand, how is that not reviewable? I mean, they do it in the NCAA. It's a reviewable hit. Sometimes they'll just whistle down. They didn't think it was, especially on the, like the funniest one is you watch a college game. They'll have the opening kickoff. The guy, for some reason, takes it out of the end zone because he's insane. And then takes to the 20-yard line. The offense is ready to go, but they blow down because there was a hit to the head or a crackback block that hit the guy in the ear hole. And a guy is... Number 36, illegal hit. He is done for the game. Please leave. And it's a 15-yard penalty. First down offense. So I, I I don't understand how that's, of all the things we review. Yeah. Especially when you've already lengthened it to 25. Mm-hmm. So you've, you've passed judgment on that hit being something that isn't doesn't warrant the ordinary 15 yards. So yeah. This is a greater degree of severity than we've ever seen before, according to the penalty issued on that play. There hadn't been a 25-yard option before this season. So they call the 25 yards, but they leave him in the game, mm-hmm. and he gets a pick and a sack. And then against Hamilton, like, pardon me, against Toronto, he gets a pick and a sack. So yep. he keeps playing, and who knows if and when Zach Kalaros is ever going to play again. I, I hope he's healthy. I do too. Great person, outstanding athlete, had some flashes of brilliance. Let's hope. Just be awesome, Zach. Just come back and get your senses back. But, yeah, it's – it. and just think if it was the 25 yards and kicked out of the game – None of this. Yeah. We wouldn't even talk about any of this. And the league, Randy Ambrosi, this is the same Randy Ambrosi he was saying during during the leading up to the collective bargaining negotiations and during about how he wants to have a, make the players to be partners. And then you issue a press release excoriating the CFLPA. So where was the mindset there as far as wanting to be partners? Make Just make a phone call to Brian Ramsey as opposed to issuing a press release and then being rather contrite the next day when you do meet the media. And this is also a commissioner of a league who, as Arash Madani pointed out, the officials did not kick Simone Lawrence out of the game after the hit. So the league's got to wear that as well. Nobody mm-hmm. looks good here. No. It's just, and it's just, and you won't even, the appeal won't even be heard until the second week of July. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't honestly. Know. That's what I don't understand either. Like, I I don't call like call one eight hundred arbitrator and get this yes, over with. Get, get Judge Wapner out here. We can, <laughs> we'll or Judy, this, Judge Judy. We need Ca- this. Cameron Judge. Just find yeah, a judge. Oh, Cameron Judge Judy. Let's do this right now. <laughs> Sorry, Cam. Uh, what else should we talk about? Anything else you want to address before I give you your leave and allow you to head back to CBC 
However you get there from here due to the road construction, you may need a helicopter or a Sherpa. CBC is awesome. I just go up Park Street, Broadway, there. Perfect. Um, I'm going to pull one out of my butt here. Plaza of Honor. Ah. Roy and Danny. I would put Roy in. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm, folks. I, Roy Shivers, uh, Danny Barrett. I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the Plaza of Honor committee. And that's that's why I, I've, that's why you could have do, you could have dodged this. The, the the Roy's name comes up. Okay. One of the problems is they used to put three or four. Well, they started off by putting ten in a year. Then yeah. They lowered it to six. Now then it was four. Then it was three. Now it's two. And you've got a whole list of elite candidates coming up. I'm not saying Roy's not elite, but if you look at players that are, are going to be due in the next three or four years. And if you're only inducting two, it's going to get really tough. But I think on merit, Roy Shivers belongs in there. You look, John Payne is in the Plaza of Honor. And rest in peace, John. He just he just died a few weeks back. But John Payne was a riders coach for four years. They, they got to the, they had a home playoff game each year. They got to the Western final each year. They lost the Grey Cup in 76. That was, and John Payne was a coach where the team got to a certain point didn't finish the job. John John Payne is in the Plaza of Honor. So I think mm-hmm. if you establish that precedent, I think there's a very good case for someone who helped the team without getting without attaining that ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. And I think Roy Shivers falls into that. And not only that, in one trade, Roy Shivers got Kerry Joseph and the rights to Darian Durant. Mm-hmm. So in one trade, he got two Grey Cup winning quarterbacks. John, Roy Shivers set the table in many ways for that t- 2007 team. And I... And if you look at the success they enjoyed for many years thereafter, Darian Durant and, and the run of success that Darian had. So I think there's a very good case for Roy. As far as Danny Barrett, I think one of the, thing, one of the things that held that rider team back from getting to where it needed to be during when Roy Shivers was here was well, the coaching staff. Okay. Uh, they won in spite of him. They won and, you know, Even they had everything point. except a quarterback and a, and a top, top, top head coach. So I think there's a, and, and that I think also has to be part of Roy's uh, legacy when you look at, at his candidacy for the plaza, but I think by and large, on merit, on balance, I think Roy Shivers should be in there, and I hope that he is at some point. Would he show up? I think he will. Okay. Roy Shivers still has a lot of friends here. That's awesome. And uh, I, in fact, I believe the Riders are inviting Roy back for a game. That's great. Uh, later this summer, so uh, I think Roy would be very happy to to return and to be honored, and I, and I hope at some point it it happens. I so s- I still have his tops St. Louis Cardinals football card. No way. Yeah, I saw it. it Cost more for shipping than for the card. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that he's like, oh man, <laughs> with some expletives in there as well. It was it was interesting dealing with Roy. Um, we got along great until Henry Burris didn't he didn't sign Henry Burris, yeah. and that was where things became. He did. But by and large, we'd have great chats and we'd talk about our fathers and we'd talk about jazz and we'd he'd talk about uh, growing up in the United States in the in the 40s and 50s and 60s and, uh, and just the, what it was like down there. Fascinating, fascinating man. Mm-hmm. And uh, by and large, I I enjoyed my dealings with Roy. I'm not sure that, feel, that the feeling was mutual, but you can attest to the fact that I'm not very good company. Well. I think you're great company. Who we walked hand in hand around the lake, didn't we? Though yeah, we did. We skipped and we threw flower, <laughs> we threw petals and <laughs> skipped rocks. <laughs> there was a violinist behind us, hit a and, duck, and, and, and it was fun. <laughs> and a goose hissed at us. Oh, they, that's true. And, and, that and is three all pedestrians all hissed all at us as well. <laughs> bike got run over by a bike. It was just oh, it was so bad. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, right. So awesome! Yeah, yeah I, it's just one of those things I had to know. Once it comes up, I was like picking your brain on things like that. Yeah, well, I'm, I hope I answered satisfactorily. Your brain has been picked. So we've had two questions today: one from Brad Thompson and one from, from Dan, Dan Plaster. Plaster. Thank you for answering my question. I'll let you get back to work. I'm sure your your uh, your fine colleagues at CBC are wondering what happened to him. <laughs> Or they're like, thank goodness he's gone. <laughs> who, who? I'm an interloper there. Who brought this guy from the There's privates into CBC? Peace at our time in CBC for part of a Monday afternoon. It's awesome. Dan Plaster, thank you so much for being with us. It's always great to, to chat, whether it's uh, in the vicinity of a duck or a goose or in the podcast. It's been great having you with us, and thanks for taking the time. Anytime. Thank you. Uh, I have to read this, um, I got, cause I, especially because I forgot last week. I should have put this on the phone and had... had is, this, is this a great ad read? It's, it's, the, it's, it's the please send us questions. Oh, yeah. Do you want to read it? Sure. This is a professional broadcaster doing this, so it's going to be flawless. This camera? All right. All right, folks. If you enjoy the prod- podcast, please leave a review and a rating. Five stars. Always. <laughs> Helps us a lot. 50. <laughs> Five out of 50. <laughs> now, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts app or wherever you get your podcasts, of course, like all the, the Google apps and that sort of thing. You can find it. Are we on uh, Spotify yet? 
Mark, are we on Spotify yet? Heck on yeah. Spotify. Spotify Mark Melichuk awesome. helps us out. Yes, Mark's in the back. I wanted to drag you into some of this, but he's just kind he's of... A, Mark's our special guest next week. Next week, he doesn't know it. So. He's lurking in the shadows. Now, if you'd like to send us or him or him and Murray, him being Rob Vanstone, a question, email Rob at rvanstone at postmedia.com. That's R-V-A-N-S-T-O-N-E at postmedia.com. And he will read it on the show. And make sure to follow Rob on Twitter at Rob Vanstone, and if you want, and uh, he's very average, like he likes a lot of food. That's uh, Murray. That's uh, <laughs> Murray at uh, LP at Murray LP. There you go, folks. It's a wrap, Dan. I should have a wrap <laughs> for Dan Plasper. I'm Rob Vanstone. Thanks so much. And we will do this next week on the 57th Rider Rumblings podcast, and it may even be on Voice Changer. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>